It is good to be with you this morning. My name is Moses, and my pronouns are he, him, and his, and I am of Mayan descent. And I say to you, lent in peace in this season. If you're visiting us for the first time on campus or online, I remind you that you are welcome, that you are loved, that you are safe, and that God is well pleased with you on this windy morning here in Hawaii. You know, my heart this morning uh, does, in fact, uh, grieve because I do pray for the migrants and refugees that are of Ukraine at our U.S. border this morning in Mexico. But I also pray for the thousands of black and brown migrants and refugees from Haiti, Mexico, and Central America who have been treated inhumanely. See, I pray for their dignity and their humanity to also be acknowledged. And I pray that our president would also take a selfie with a black and brown little girl as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. It was an evening prayer meeting held at the Salvation Army Family Shelter in downtown Los Angeles. I was asked to provide spiritual care for this lovely community of people. And so I asked them if they wanted to gather and pray and if they would like to share their stories. As we gathered, in comes a woman of color with three small children and attends the meeting. The children are properly take, taken to the children's activities and then I proceeded to introduce myself to this woman saying, hello, my name is Moses, I'm the pastor. I'm so glad you are here. And she politely thanked me. We commenced the gathering, I shared some songs, some scriptures, and then the moment came for story sharing. And she shared. This woman shared from her heart her story of hardship and loss, how she had ended up in the streets with her children, and how she attempted to find refuge in the church, but was only met with judgment, indifference, and unacceptance. I was heartbroken to hear such rejection from the church, but not surprised, sadly to say. After the meeting ended, I walked over to her and I said, I hope you come back again. Thank you for sharing your story. And then I said these words, the world needs more people like you. She couldn't believe that someone would say such a thing to her. She was overcome with joy, but overcome with tears. And so was I. She became a faithful attender to our group, but all she needed to hear that first time was those words, those simple words, the world needs more people like you. I titled today's sermon, Beauty in All of Its Senses. Today's wisdom is one of those narratives that is presented in all four Gospels. The Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke present the woman character as anonymous. However, John's Gospel, which is normally conflated with the other three Gospels, gives us a more detailed understanding of this passage. It gives us the name of this woman. I should mention that John's Gospel, it is very different. It's the uh, gospel that uh, is so much uh, is shared in there uh, because it is distinctly different uh, in comparison to the other three synoptic gospels. There is a considerable amount of material found only in John's gospel and thus making it a very fascinating read and a supplement to the other three gospels. But certainly, John's perspective as the only gospel writer who actually lived with Jesus matters. He followed Jesus closely, and in my opinion, gives us a friendly perspective, shall we say, an honest first-hand experience. And so John's gospel makes it clear that Jesus is divine and that Jesus is the true Son of God. But to today, truly understand this passage that we just read, we got to go back a few verses into chapter 11, verses 55 through 57, because Passover was near. Do you know what Passover is? 
It is a festival that commemorates God's liberation of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. In fact, Passover 2022 will be celebrated very soon by our Jewish siblings when it begins on April 15 after nightfall. Many in this narrative were going up to Jerusalem for Passover to purify themselves, but they were also looking for Jesus because they doubted that he would even show up because by this time it was well known that Jesus was an outlaw. Jesus end was near. Yet, this passage begins like nothing of this is happening at all. It begins in Bethany, a city way outside of Jerusalem with a dinner, but just not any dinner. I would say to you, a feast with friends, with family, shall we say. And it was Martha's house. She was the woman in charge of the household, doing what she does best, hard at work, using her hands, preparing the meal because she loved to serve Jesus. And her sister and her brother were there as well. Lazarus, who Jesus had raised from the dead, was at the table, surely thankful, surely happy. And Mary, who offers Jesus perhaps the most unconventional expression of devotion, takes this costly perfume, uses a generous portion of that perfume, rubs it on the feet of Jesus, and then proceeds to dry his feet with her hair. Scripture says that though that the house was filled with the aroma of the perfume. Can you imagine such a scene? Now, Judas, Jesus' disciple, enters the scene complaining, judging, because he considers Mary's act wasteful. But Jesus defends Mary, tells Judas, leave her alone. And so, for a moment, let's let all of that sink in, that imagery, that story, that narrative, let it sink in for a moment. Because I believe that this is where we get to engage God this morning. As the Holy Wisdom enters the room, here is where we invite the Holy Spirit to guide us, to lead us, to counsel us, to comfort us, to help us. Because no matter what you're going through this morning, the divine, the presence, the, the benevolent Trinitarian God is in this room. You see, today's wisdom is inherently universal. This wisdom doesn't belong to a religious group or an ethnicity or race. It doesn't matter your age, how you grew up, your upbringing. This kind of wisdom is for all people. Every person in the room can connect and understand this wisdom. It doesn't belong to Christianity. It certainly is not some philosophical, uh, philosophical or some ideological uh, thought or idea. I mean, even Will Smith, Gina Pickett, and Chris Rock, you get to hear this wisdom as well. Because this wisdom is so simple and yet so powerful. And here it is. You, and you, and you, and you, and you in this room are beautiful. Some will attempt to distort that reality, but remember, God says you are beautiful. So simple, right? Yet you'll be surprised how many people don't hear that at all who've never heard that in their life, who want to hear it, but just never hear it from someone. You are beautiful, some will attempt to distort that, but God says you are beautiful. This passage today sounds yet simplistic, but yet we cannot diminish what happens here because Mary is at the feet of Jesus. And that act, it is beautiful. It is an act of extravagant love. It is a bold act of devotion. It is precious, poetic, lovely, abundant, generous. And yet Judas attempts to distort the moment. 
calling it wasteful, not good, not enough. Let's feed the poor. Let's give it to the poor. Careless, not beautiful. But Jesus comes to the rescue, defends Mary, rejects the distortion, and declares it indeed beautiful. You see, I wonder how many times have we been made free to feel by a person, by society, by uh, some system, some corporation, some, some church, that we are not good enough, that we are not beautiful enough. See, I wonder how many of us have been told to change this or to do that in order to be good enough, in order to be accepted and considered beautiful. So let me pose this question now. Who gets to decide what is beautiful, good, and acceptable? But before I answer that, let me say something about Mary, because Mary's actions are public actions. They are risky. They could be misinterpreted because she has no shame, no fear, and no hesitation whatsoever. It's like she knew something. It's like she had hacked the system, shall we say. Nonetheless, she gives all of her love to Jesus because love is not love if it, it calculates the cost. Love gives it all, not just a portion of it. And this love is demonstrated with a great sign of honor and devotion to wash Jesus' feet with her hands, to dry Jesus' feet with her hair. You must know, a woman's hair had certain meanings in antiquity in Palestine. If a married woman uh, was married, a woman's hair would be bound up never to be seen in public again. It was a sign of immorality for a married woman to visibly show her hair. And so Mary must have been unmarried to let her hair be uncovered and visible. Surely, some may have judged her, but her love blinded her from such criticism. That's what true love does to you, right? True love does not pay attention to such things. True love does not care what others think or see because true love considers it a joy for the world to know. True love does not hide. Mary does not hide her extravagant love for Jesus. And what about the perfume? So costly, so expensive, worth a full year's wages. And she takes a generous portion of it, so much so that the house is filled with fragrance from the perfume, and Mary anoints Jesus' feet. You see, some theologians believe that she was symbolically anointing the body of Jesus for his burial. And while the outside world prepares to arrest him, prepares to murder him, here in this house, in this family, they are welcoming Jesus with perfume, food, and hospitality. You see, I wonder this morning, is the purpose of this text to challenge us and the way we're living? Perhaps we should be like Mary, unafraid of what others say of us, willing to take risks, spending our lives for the healing and reconciling of our creation, offering ourselves generously in abundance, in fullness. Are you offering yourself generously? Are you offering yourself in fullness? Are you willing to take risks? You see, many offer only the things that are labeled as good. But God wants us also to uh, give the things that are hidden from the world because somehow we consider them not good, not beautiful, and not acceptable. And this is why. We must answer the question this morning, who gets to decide what is beautiful, what is good, and what is acceptable? Who gets to decide what beauty constitutes? Well, let me answer it by telling you about Judas. You see, Jesus trusted Judas. Jesus expected the best from Judas. And still Judas becomes a thief and a traitor. And even though Judas had just witnessed this miraculous, beautiful, uh, you know, showing of love by Mary, he somehow misses it. 
He sees wastefulness. He sees not beauty. He sees not goodness. And we can learn from Judas this morning. He only saw what was inside of him. Let me ask you, what is inside of you? Because whatever you look for, you will find. Did you hear? I'll say that again, in case you missed it. Whatever you look for, you will find. If you dislike a person, you will misinterpret even their most beautiful moments. See, I guess what I'm saying is that a warped mind brings a warped view of others. What is beautiful is seen as hideous. And what is acceptable is seen as unsuitable. What is good is seen as deplorable. You see what you have inside of you. If you look for beauty, you will find beauty. But if you look for wastefulness, you will find that. See, there's a Spanish word that I want to teach you this morning. The word is hermosa. Everyone say hermosa. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. There's a cousin noun to this. It's called hermosura. Everyone say hermosura. Now, hermosura means beauty, but it means beauty in all of its senses. Beauty in all of its senses. And I guess what I hope for us this morning is that you will hear this this morning, that what society may consider wasteful, unimpressive, not beautiful, that you would hear the voice of Jesus affirming your beauty and your goodness. Because beauty is directly linked, attached, tied to identity. See, I remember when the girls were like four or five years old, I would always say to them, you know, when I was driving to school, we were driving somewhere, because all oh, that's all we do in Los Angeles is drive. I would tell the girls, you are smart, your hair is beautiful, the color of your skin is beautiful, I love your smile, I love your eyes, you are beautiful. Because I wanted them to know that no matter what they would see on television, no matter what they would hear at school, they needed to know that they were beautiful. There's some alarming statistics today about girls that I want to share with you. Between the ages of 9 and 13, about 30% of girls are losing their confidence. And more than 50% of girls feel pressure to be perfect and are afraid to fail. New York Times best-selling authors Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman wrote this book, The Confidence Code for Girls. And they say in that book that girls need to risk more, think less, and be themselves, to take risks, to move beyond self-doubt, and learn to see failure as a learning opportunity. Did you read Penn State University had a study and a research they recently published their work on the Journal of Family Psychology. And you know what they discovered? That close, supportive relationship with parents, especially with dad, at key points during adolescence can help with adjustment problems such as self-esteem, weight concerns, and depressive symptoms. The research also showed that mother-adolescent intimacy was associated with fewer depressive symptoms around the age of 15, and that father-youth intimacy was associated with fewer weight concerns for both girls and boys. Do you know what this means? That as parents of children, adolescents, of youth, as grandparents of these same ages, we too play an important role in the identity and in the beauty of our children. You see, this is not an issue just for our youth, not just for our young people, but it's also an an issue for communities of color, communities that have been marginalized, that have been oppressed. I know people in the BIPOC community, in the LGBTQIA plus communities who have experienced rejection of their beauty 
made to feel that they're not beautiful enough, not smart enough, not normal enough. Some have felt the pressures to change themselves in order to fit in to this Eurocentric dominance and system, to lose weight, to change one's hair, to change one's clothes, to love this kind of person or that kind of person. But I must call it out, that is unbiblical. That is not the Word of God. Because you know what the Word of God says about you? Psalm 139 says that for you were created in the inmost thing. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You know what this means? This means that God took time to create you. That God took time to be with you. This means that you have God's full attention. And those who make you feel wasteful, hideous, unimpressive, unsuitable, those who make you feel like you need to live up to their standards, well, those are just a bunch of Judases. Falsely attempting to distort your beauty and identity because we are all called to be Mary's. Your beauty is rooted in your identity in the triune God. You are inherently beautiful because Jesus says so. You are expensive perfume for the world because Jesus says so. And this is the contrast, after all, in this passage, right? Judas betrays Jesus. Mary honors Jesus. Judas steals from Jesus. Mary gives to Jesus because Mary knew that Jesus' time was coming to an end. Time was running out. This would be her last opportunity. She gives everything she has, her perfume, her devotion, her hair, her reputation, her love. And it makes a lot of sense. It really does. Because you know who else gave up everything? Jesus. He gave up his life, his body, his blood, his reputation chose to die on a cross to spend his life for us, took away our shames, failures, mistakes, transgressions, our doubts, and gave us his forgiveness, his successes, his righteousness, and his beauty. And three days later, he rose from the dead to give us liberation. Liberation for what? I would say liberation to be ourselves. It's quite beautiful, really. All God wants is for you to be you. There's only one of you in the world. Uniquely and wonderfully made. And the world needs you to be you. I don't know who needs to hear this this morning, but some things need to be done now. Because the opportunity may never come again. This is especially true when expressing love for oneself or for someone else. Life is way too short. And this week I wrote a text to my kids because I wanted them to know just how proud I was of them. Namalee isn't here. She's doing her driver's ed. But I wanted them to know that I'm proud of their gifts, of their beauty, the amazing things they're doing in life. I wanted them to know that I love them, that mom loves them, and then more importantly, God loves them. That God is already pleased with them. I mean, Penelope is a STEM girl, right? At UH, studying the sciences, working at Long's as a pharmacy tech, and has some great career goals. Amelie is a leader at her school, in our church council, completing her IB rigorous study program, doing her driver's training, and studying for ASATs all at the same time. I don't know if I could ever do that. And Hansel is a lovely boy, training for football, playing his video games, getting really good grades, and showing his care and his compassion for those around him. They are hermosuras, beauty in all of its senses. 
and some things need to be done now, said now, expressed now, not waiting for later. I end with these lyrics today from a song titled, You Say, from Laura Daigle, because I believe it embodies so much of what I've been attempting to say to you this morning. This is what it says. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. And you say I am held when I am falling short. And when I don't belong, oh, you say I am yours. And I believe, oh, I believe. What you say of me, I believe. The only thing that matters now is everything you think of me. In you I find my worth. In you I find my identity. Taking all I have, and now I'm laying it at your feet. You have every failure, God. You have every victory. May we remember that the triune God has already given us an identity. We are beautiful, fully loved, wholly accepted, graced, forgiven, and liberated. No more shame, no more hesitation, no more fear. For God is with us. Go be you. In this world. Word of God and Word of Life, and we all say together, thanks be to God. Let's pray this morning.